Canto 11 is one of the most beautiful cantos of In Memoriam, A.H.H. -H. It describes the calm of the morning. Not just the morning is calm. Nature herself is calm. We find in the canto loving descriptions of nature which make one, which compel one to say that Lord Tennyson is as good a nature poet, as great a nature poet as William Wordsworth himself. The morning is calm, nature is calm. You must remember that England is a land of extraordinary scenic beauty. The scenic beauty of England rivals that of Switzerland and at least according to Angle Files is better than that of Switzerland. In this canto, the poet brings into conjunction the morning which has come nature which has come the speaker himself who experiences a calm despair and finally Hallam who is sleeping very calmly because it is his last sleep in the ship that brings him from the continent to England. The poet now works out a deliberate and systematic contrast from the calm of Canto 11. We move to the turmoil of Canto 12. In Canto 12, we find the speaker in a state of high emotional instability, high emotional turmoil. There is a beautiful image of the carrier pigeon, the carrier pigeon with its sorrowful message attached to itself. Similarly, the poet finds a very painful message, a very sorrowful message attached to his soul. And like the carrier pigeon, the soul rises high and flies to the ship, bringing the body of Hallam. The poet's body is left behind. The poet's soul rises high and flies to the ship. The poet's soul wonders whether this is the result of all his love and care. The poet's soul, very much like a carrier pigeon, takes a close look of, takes a close look of the body of Hallam in the cabin of the ship. The body looks so fresh that one can say that Hallam died only an hour earlier. The poet now sheds tears, the tears of a widower. The poet is like the widower who sees his wife in a dream and tries to clasp her only to realize that he has seen his wife in a dream and not in real life. The fact is that the poet's friend is dead once and for all. He has left this world. He will never come back. The poet appeals to time, hoping that time will heal this 
extremely painful loss. Hoping the time will help him realize the truth that his sufferings are real and not merely the products of idle fancy or dream and that he has a real reason for grief that he has a real reason for shedding tears profusely the poet's imagination soars high and he suddenly starts believing that his dear friend is not actually dead he tries to convince himself he tries to believe that Hallam is alive and as a result he looks at the approaching ship the approaching ship bringing the mortal remains of Hallam rather indifferently as if it were bringing the cargo of some merchant and not the dead body of his dear friend. The poet now gives his imagination free reign. The poet gets a report to the effect that the ship carrying Hallam's body has arrived at the port. The speaker, the poet, rushes to the port. He goes to the quay. The ship has indeed arrived. The passengers come out of the ship. And it is the ship supposed to be carrying the body of Hallam. And along with the passengers, Hallam himself comes out. Hallam shakes the speaker's hand. And poses a number of questions inquires inquires about home the poet explains that he has been overtaken by sorrow that he has been overwhelmed by grief and the poet explains the reason for it Hallam wonders what has happened to the speaker what madness has overcome the speaker and there is not a touch of change. There is not a hint of death in the frame of Hallam. If such incidents were to take place, the poet should not feel it to be strange. Canto 15 contains a powerful description of a storm. Let us read the opening stanza. Tonight the winds begin to rise and roar from yonder dropping day. The last red leaf is whirled away. The rocks are blown about the skies. Is there any other poet? Is there any other English language poet? Except Shakespeare. Who can describe a storm so graphically, so effectively, in such a detailed manner that the sensitive reader is able to see the storm right in front of his eyes, that the sensitive reader is able to feel the storm blowing all around him. That is why I keep on telling my students that Tennyson may be overrated as a poet in general, but he is underrated as a nature poet. It is true that a storm is blowing all around the speaker, but the speaker fancies that, imagines that, there is no storm around a ship carrying Hallam's body. And that the ship carrying Hallam's body is having a safe passage, a comfortable passage. In the last answer of the canto, 
the poet works out an interpenetration of the majestic storm and the equally majestic sunset. The majestic storm rises in the western horizon and the majestic sunset also takes place in the western horizon. At least on one level, in memoriam, A-H-H is a catena of contradictions. At one point, the poet says that all is calm. At the next point, the poet says that a storm has broken out. What is this but contradiction? The poet himself becomes aware of these contradictory twists and turns in the thematic trajectory of the poem. And this awareness is embodied in Canto 16. The poet makes use of a beautiful metaphor. The metaphor of a lake whose surface reflects a clear sky at one point and reflects a clouded sky at the next point. But below the surface, which displays such differing reflections, lies the depths of the lake, the depths of the still dark waters, the depths which are always the same. Similarly, the poet's mind on the surface appears calm at one point and turbulent at the next. The poet now brings in another striking image, that of a bark. A bark is a ship, a sailing ship with three or more masts. The bark hits against a rocky shelf, a craggy shelf and staggers blindly before she sings. Perhaps the poet is very much like the bark which has struck against a craggy shelf. Maybe the poet has lost his mental balance and speaks in contradictory terms, speaks in voices which violently contradict each other. I would like to pause the class for some time and share with you a remark made by T.S. Eliot about Tennyson. This is what Eliot says, and I quote, Tennyson is a great poet for reasons that are perfectly clear. He has three qualities which are seldom found together except in the greatest poets. Abundance, variety and complete competence. Unquote. Whenever I teach Tennyson, I quote this evaluation of Tennyson carried out by Eliot and I request my students to absorb this 
evaluation. It is not necessary that you should memorize this passage word by word. Well and good if you are able to do it, but if not, please absorb what Eliot says in this passage. You can use it when you write about Tennyson in your examination, maybe in your essay or maybe even more in the common paragraph of your annotation. Let me repeat the observation of T.S. Eliot. Tennyson is a great poet for reasons that are perfectly clear. He has three qualities which are seldom found to gather except in the greatest poets. Abundance, variety and complete competence. In Canto 17, the poet speaks of the ship bringing the mortal remains of Hallam to England. The ship moves safely to English shores, protected by the prayers of the poet. The poet helps that the tempest of the mid-ocean may spare the ship and the ship may reach England safely. In the last answer, the poet says that the ship has done a great job bringing the precious relics of Hallam, the friend, the great friend of the poet who has breathed his last, who has left this world forever and without whom the poet will have to live the rest of his life. There appears to be a slight confusion here. In Canto 17, the poet gives the impression that the ashes of Hallam are being brought home. In the last answer of Canto 17, the poet speaks of the dust of him, making it clear that what is being brought home is the dust of the man, the ashes of the man who has been cremated. But in Canto 12, the poet speaks of, in the last stanza of Canto 12, the last stanza of Canto 12, the poet speaks of to where the body sits and learn that I have been an hour away. So, in Canto 12, we are given the impression that the body of Hallam is being brought to England. In Canto 17, we are given the impression that the ashes of Hallam are being brought to England. Well, uh, a poem should be read as a poem and not as a report on an event. Canto 18 deals with the burial of the body of Hallam. The body of Hallam is buried in St. Andrew's Church, Clevedon. In the present canto, the poet says that it is well that, it is well that Hallam is buried in England, that he is laid in English earth, and that from his ashes, English flowers, the poet specifies the violet, that from his ashes, the violet of his native land will sprout. It may be a small thing, it may be a trifle, 
but it is a happy thing that Halem is buried not in a foreign country but in his own native land. Even at this point the poet is not fully reconciled to the death of his friend. When he falls, when the poet falls on the faithful heart of Halem, when the poet falls on the body of Halem, to kill the lips of Halem, his last kiss, he may impart his breath to Halem, and Halem may become alive again. And the life that he imparts to Halem, his own life, is life that is almost dead. For the poet, life without Halem is as good as death. And so, if he succeeds in imparting life to Hallam, it is his own life which is as good as or as bad as death and which is now becoming aware of the finality of the loss, of the nature of the loss, of the fact that the loss cannot be reversed and is attempting with difficulty to accept the loss and to live with the loss. I would like to work out a contrast which is also a comparison between the canto of In Memoriam A.H.H. in hand and the extremely famous poem of Rupert Brooke titled the soldier. It is a favorite poem or recitation and I remember reciting it as a schoolboy. The soldier of Rupert Brooke is a sort of silly lucky in which the soldier says that if he dies in the front and is buried there in some foreign country, the place where he is buried will become forever England. Let me try to remember the opening lines. If I should die, think this of me. I'm sorry, there's a slight correction. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. The Tennyson Canto speaks of the glory of being buried, of being buried in one's own native land, of being buried in England, in one's native village. The Brook poem speaks of the glory of being buried in a foreign land and converting that spot, that spot of the foreign land into England forever. Canto 19 is the famous canto of the rivers. When I took my MA examination, I was asked to write a short note 
on the canto of the rivers. The canto of the rivers is a good example of Tennyson's poetry at its very best. It demonstrates how accomplished a poet, how accomplished a worthy fire Tennyson is. The canto of the rivers links together three rivers, the Danube, the Severn, and the Y. And after linking all the three together, it links them to the poet and then to Hallam and thus to the central thematic concern of the work. The Danube is the second longest river in Europe. I think it's the longest river in Europe after the Volga. The, da the Danube flows through Central Europe and Eastern Europe and quite a few cities stand on its banks and one of those cities is Vienna where Hallam breathes his last. Another city by the way is Budapest. The Severn is the longest river in Great Britain and I think by the way the second longest river is the Thames. The Y is the fourth longest river in the United Kingdom. The Y and the Seven are interconnected and the Seven flows through Clevedon where St. Andrew's Church stands and St. Andrew's Church is where Hallam's mortal remains are buried. The poet points out that the Severn is filled with salt sea water, with sea water twice a day and the Severn carries this sea water to the Y and as a result of the high tide the seawater flowing into the Y, the Y becomes silent. But when the tide flows down, the Y becomes vocal again. The battle is between the seven and the Y on the one hand and the poet and the poet's heart on the other. There are moments when the poet's sorrow is so overwhelming that it compels him to be silent, that he finds it impossible to express his grief. And there are also moments when the poet's sorrow compels him to be vocal. This canto showcases some of the cardinal strengths of Tennyson's poetry. And these strengths, strengths include a gifted imagination. Look at the imagination of Tennyson here, how he interconnects Three rivers, the Danube in faraway Europe, the Seven and the Y, and how he interconnects the rivers to him to himself and to Hallam and to the central theme of the work. These strengths include a magical versification. If you read the canto carefully, 
you can feel the flowing of water. You can feel the gushing of water through a river. The versification of the canto powerfully captures the movement of water through a river. The strengths include the poet's infinite ability to focus attention on, to highlight the numerous facets of the same thematic diamond. If the central theme of the work is a diamond, the work demonstrates that the diamond has numerous facets. And in this canto in particular, light is thrown upon, light is focused upon the different, the different facets of the brilliant diamond. Canto 20 utilizes a homely metaphor to differentiate between lesser griefs, lesser griefs and griefs which are really deep. The servants of a man newly dead experience only lesser griefs and they express their griefs fully. They are worried that it will be difficult for them to find another master like the dead man. It will be hard, they say, to find another service such as this. But inside the house, near the hearth, the children of the dead man sit. They experience griefs which are really profound, which are really deep. And so they are unable to express their griefs. They don't say anything. They don't give expression to anything. They sit cold in that atmosphere of death. They move around noiselessly as if they were ghosts, as if they were phantoms. They see a vacant, they see a vacant chair and think, how good, how kind, and he is gone. This canto makes use of a very ordinary metaphor, a very homely metaphor to capture a very profound difference, differentiation. This canto has a Shakespearean touch because Shakespeare is the ultimate master of the homely metaphor in English literature. 